This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. My AdSense revenue has completely tanked in the last couple months. So if you'd like to help support this channel and get a bunch of cool perks while you're at it, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. What if we stopped working? No, really, what if tomorrow we just didn't clock in? What if every single one of us just stopped right now and saw what would happen? Bikini Bottom is literally in a state of total chaos tonight. Oh, literally. The real answer is things would go downhill real fast. It would be, like, so bad. Empty shelves, empty cities, empty promises even. We wouldn't make it very long without anybody doing anything we call work. But that doesn't make what if we stopped working a useless question. Because in an otherwise simple answer, it would suck, there's something a little more interesting hiding in the background, just out of focus. What is that? Enhance. Enhance. If the answer to what if we stopped working is we can't, that begs the question, how close can we get? And that question, well, that question has some pretty interesting answers. Let's back up. If you go to parties, you've probably been asked the question, what do you do? If you answer, I make YouTube videos, no you don't. Who would ever give you the chance to give that answer? See, the joke here is that YouTubers have no friends. Like, no one at all. Like, bottom of the barrel, trapped in a pit of loneliness. Anyway, the fact that what do you do is the default punch bowl question demonstrates at least one thing about our current society. Work is one of, if not the biggest part of our lives. But it doesn't have to be. Already, multiple countries are trying out things like a four-day work week. How does this work? In countries like New Zealand, Spain, and Iceland, they ran experiments with shortening the work week to just four days, and then they wrote down the results and now we're looking at them. One of the better known cases here is Iceland, which ran a couple experiments between 2015 and 2019 after unions started pushing for more time off. For a lucky 2,500 Icelandics, I, I, Icelandists? For a lucky 2,500 people, time on the job was decreased to just four days, going from 40 to around 35 hours a week. Crucially, without salaries going down, even a single frozen fish, or whatever they use for currency over there. Unsurprisingly, it worked really well. People were happier, less likely to experience burnout, healthier. Overall, they just had a better life. And thanks to the successes of the experiment and the strength of trade unions, over 80% of people in all of Iceland shortened their working hours or gained the right to after these trials were run. Even fancy business people in suits were happier because they got to save on some of their costs and didn't see a dip in productivity. Because, as you might not find very surprising, productivity has a diminishing returns curve. The longer you work, the less productive you are. Each new hour of time on the job brings less and less benefit and is more and more justified in being lopped off entirely. And these sorts of experiments are all well and good, but what if we went even further? This week's episode is a little different. Usually, videos on this channel focus on the bad stuff. Ooh, we hate bad stuff. Sorry, ignore him. I don't know how he got in here. And no doubt about it, this video is still going to have some of that with a side of political theory to appease the nerds. But for the next 15 or so minutes, we're mainly going to answer a couple questions about work. What it is, why it's such a big deal for some people, and why it could just not be. Because it could. We don't need to work so damn hard. You'd think that that fact would make for easy political points, just right there for the taking. Who wouldn't vote for the candidate or the party that's going to make their lives more pleasant, less constrained, more free of work? And in some countries, they do have that kind of politics. But the reality is that neither major political party here in the U.S. is trying to reduce the time we spend at work. Uh, we have to get back to work. Our people want to work. They want to go back. They have to go back. A job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about your place in the community. My North neither party is trying to meaningfully reduce our working hours despite enough people hating their jobs so much that Forbes, of all magazines, can run a listicle with 15 ways to quote, rise above resenting your job, with such helpful tips as, get over it. That's not to say that the sentiment doesn't exist at all in our government. Democrat Mark Takano is trying to get a bill for a 32-hour workweek through Congress. But by and large, neither party is anti-work. Should they be? Okay, let's go over some definitions. Despite being an illegal wordle guess, Work is actually a word. 
work is the effect we have on the world. It's using your physical or mental effort to achieve something. Without any work at all by anyone, we'd all die. Without nurses, electricians, teachers, people getting out of bed to make breakfast, society would crumble pretty quickly. We would be completely idle and not for long. Some amount of work always needs to be done. Nowadays, some work gets paid with money, and some work gets paid with no money or barely any money, and also disdain. Being against work, or anti-work if you spend any time on the worst place on the internet, isn't ignoring that fact. It's recognizing that some work always needs to be done, but that the conditions that shape that work should be different than they are now. It's saying that the goal shouldn't be to work as much as possible, but as little as possible to achieve what we want. The goal is to maximize leisure and the quality of that leisure by balancing that interest with the necessity of work. The goal isn't to not work at all, but to work for things that matter and on good terms. This is gonna sound really obvious, but for most of us, that's not how work goes. Work is something we need to do to get access to the things we need to live, like food, shelter, and healthcare. Under capitalism, the only way to get these basic necessities of life is to work in some way or another and get a wage at the end. You work, or you starve. Seems pretty coercive. While at work, you have no or very little input on your work conditions. Sometimes they're okay, other times not. On top of that, our whole lives are conditioning us for that reality and imbuing it with value. Work will set you free, no pain, no gain, or there's no such thing as a free lunch are some examples of the ideological discourse that accompanies the material reality of coercion and makes it seem more natural, more palatable. Our necessity to work is accompanied by a psychopolitics trying to enshrine work, in the largest possible sense, as a value. But it doesn't seem to work as well as the benefactors of that discourse want it to. When you consider how much of our time we spend thinking about not working, whether it's dreaming up a vacation we want to take, fantasizing about winning the lottery and quitting, or buying an ironic Garfield mug, it seems like we all want to stop working pretty badly. And yet, when we're given the chance, a good chunk of us keep working even when we don't need to. Some billionaires still work, as do many lottery winners. Retirees often volunteer or continue working in some capacity, even when their needs are met and they're supposed to be in the part of their lives where they stop. So do we like to work or do we hate it? The obvious answer is that it depends. What does it depend on? Meaning. When we find work meaningful, we're more than happy to do it. And there are a couple ways that work can have meaning. There's the most obvious one, which is that work which allows us to develop our talents and interests, to self-actualize. Then there's work that grants us autonomy and control over the work itself and the product of that work. And of course, there's work that produces something of importance. These kinds of really obvious factors give work meaning and help explain why people work on things even when they have no need to and could live in complete and total leisure. But unfortunately, in the US and the UK, around a quarter of people feel like their job is completely meaningless. And a big chunk of people on top of that aren't really sure, don't really know if their job is meaningless. They just don't know, they, they can't figure it out. Which is really to say that their jobs aren't evidently meaningful either. That doesn't mean that every single one of their jobs is entirely pointless. Meaning and purpose are different, even if there's bound to be a big overlap in that group between pointless and meaningless work. But it definitely means that, at the very least, those jobs are alienating. They're jobs that feel bad to do. They're jobs that aren't imbued with meaning. And that's not even the whole picture. Of the 8 to 9 hours spent every day at work by millions of people, between 1.5 and 3 of them are spent on private activities. We might call this wasted time. Not in the sense that it's not good, it's totally fine by me, but in the sense that it's not really the purpose of being at your job. But as you might expect or are doing right now watching this video, in which case, nice, Workers spending that time on personal things are still pretending like they're being productive during these hours of work that aren't quite downtime, but aren't quite work either. It's ridiculous. While part of this rightfully stolen time is a form of worker resistance, the clear majority of it comes from having nothing to do but being stuck at work, forced to keep up the appearance of click clacking away or calling people who really don't want to talk to you, just because that's what your boss expects. You're not really free to do what you want, but you're not really working either. And when people are working, not committing quote, time theft, an even bigger number of them are working on pointless, mind-numbing tasks like moving data from one Excel spreadsheet to another, responding to emails, 
or writing reports for someone to throw in a drawer and never look at. Busy work. The point of all this is that there's a tremendous number of people who do nothing at all, all day, by their own admission, but still have to do it. There's a true army's worth of people wasting their lives behind computers, standing up for long hours in the same two square feet, working through the night, and for what? A great many of them just for the appearance of productivity, or the appearance of luxury, or the appearance of importance, to make someone else feel good and pad their wallet just that little bit more by making sure everyone else knows how very important they are. After all, why would someone who's not important have all those underlings? The cost of this bullshit economy is tremendous. Bullshit workers are being robbed of a life. And we have a terrible response to this fact of modern society. In liberal circles, the idea is to redirect everybody to public works projects, achieve full employment, bringing money into people's hands so they can spend it on goods that recirculate that money into the economy and produce more, trying to give, quote, dignity to jobs that are clearly just exploitation turned up to 11. On the right, the idea is to pump more money into businesses on the foolish hope that they're going to just create more jobs or deregulate workers' rights to the extreme so that they can fire everybody into the worst kind of poverty we can conjure up, and pay the lucky few still employed next to nothing, run the leanest operation possible, uberize everything, and sell the precarity of unstable, low-paid work without a safety net as choosing your own hours, or being your own boss. Very few people are willing to embrace the most obvious conclusion. A lot of this is unnecessary. We're working too much. If we distribute the workload and the benefits more evenly, we can work a lot less. Politics isn't the only place where myopic conclusions about work are reached. When we get out of the realm of explicitly political discourse, and into the space we arbitrarily separate out as social, the same tropes and attachment to work aren't hard to find. Hustle culture, the rise and grind set, whatever you want to call the ideology juice that gets a millionaire to spend his free time flipping garage sale toys for 15 bucks. This modern phenomenon is another way in which this political attachment to the Protestant work ethic gets absorbed into our everyday lives. Another way to try to attach meaning to exploitative work, rather than limit labor to work that is already meaningful and practical. Instead, shaping people's entire identity around turning idle time into another buck. Clearly we have an abundance of free time right there for the taking. So many people wouldn't feel like their jobs were meaningless if there wasn't some truth to it. So much time at work wouldn't be spent slacking if it couldn't be. The truth is, we've made tremendous progress in terms of productivity over the last 100 years. Automation and industrialization alone have taken some of the more laborious activities we used to call work out of human hands entirely. But in over 80 years, the 40-hour work week hasn't budged. It's not laziness to ask for more time for leisure. It's efficiency. It's purely pragmatic. We accomplish the same amount in a couple hours as it used to take a full day. More on a Monday than used to be possible with most of a week. We automated away many of the things we didn't want to do so that we had the time to do the things that we do want to do. Spending that time we earned creating new jobs where we feel stuck at work for hours on end just because we have no good mechanism to distribute work and protect the unemployed means failing to realize the goals of automation. It is wasting all that progress. And yes, it's undoubtedly not so black and white. Some of the industrialization and automation of the past century has allowed us to take on new work that does actually improve our quality of life. But focusing exclusively on that to justify useless jobs with the sole purpose of padding some higher-up's wallet and satisfying the doctrine that, well, everybody has to work, is ignoring the main way we could be improving our lives today, making work a smaller part of it. Okay, so what if we tried answering the question, how close can we get to eliminating work, in an unscientific way? If we took the estimate of 25% of people having meaningless jobs at face value, which in all fairness is a stretch, we're eliminating 25% of our work hours. Work weeks go from 40 hours to 32 here in the US. That's not bad. And we don't have to accept the fact that these jobs are actually meaningless to want to reduce the time spent on them. Even if these jobs do have a purpose, the feeling of meaninglessness they create clearly demonstrates that they are incredibly mentally damaging for the people working in them. Reducing those hours, like we would with incredibly physically demanding jobs, makes sense beyond a strict productivity maximization framework. 
In another example, what if we took that statistic about one and a half to three hours being completely wasted every day? Taking that into account, you end up with somewhere between a 27 and a 33 hour work week. That's also pretty good. And if this seems like an absurd way to calculate how much time we're working, I agree with you. I shouldn't be plucking numbers out of this or that study, doing simple divisions and calling it a day. But this is no less absurd than how we determine work hours right now. Just a couple people at every company write your contract. They set your working hours, with the only limit being what the law says they can't go over, pushing most industries right up to that 40 hour clock out. And the only reason that number isn't any higher is thanks to decades of worker agitation, revolts, protests, demonstrations, other synonyms for people being angry, clawing it from industry. Were it not for the gains of militant workers, we'd still be punching in 12-hour days side by side with newly minted 12-year-olds. This is an absurd way to decide how much work needs to be done. Letting a couple guys make all their demands, and only tempering them when society faces mass-scale agitation and violence bubbling up in the streets is absurd. It shouldn't get to this point. The clearly better way to determine working time is to work for necessity and desire to make decisions in common about needs and allocations of resources, to use governments, organizations, and democracy everywhere across the board to establish how much we work and how much we set aside for leisure, to disentangle work from necessity so that we can really make these decisions without constantly fearing for our meals and fighting others for the scraps. In short, to include democracy in economic decisions to take into account our resources and desire to work without constantly fearing that every drop of sweat we don't shed means worrying about being taken over by the other, sweatier worker at the other, sweatier company. To stop people who profiteer off the work of others by hogging everyone else's free time. To not have a system that decides how much we work based on how much the guy at the top really wants a new watch, missed birthdays, funerals, and every other life event in between be damned. Now, this isn't about getting back to some primitive way of life, idealized beyond the reality of tremendous hardship and ableism past societies encountered without the technological and social advancements we have today. This is about taking stock of all the time going straight down the drain for no good reason other than keeping an unjust system chugging along. This is about enjoying a life like we have now with more time to actually enjoy it. If you spent a couple less hours at Best Buy, would society be okay? or AutoZone, or making coffee, or on the clock in your cubicle. Sure, GDP could go down a bit, but we already know how the GDP gets broken down between the rich and the poor anyway. We wouldn't be maximizing profits and exhausting all the human labor power at our disposal. But that is not the point of being human in the first place. So long as we can reorganize our society towards one in which GDP dips aren't synonymous with austerity for the majority, where we care more about the productive resources at our disposal than the numbers on a screen meant as a proxy of those resources, we can dramatically change the nature of work and how much time we decide to put into it. Even without touching those structures, we can still meaningfully cut our work time. Today, burnout rates are through the roof. More and more people are being pushed into holding multiple jobs. People are desperate for leisure time, but can't afford to take it. We as human beings need time to do whatever we want, for everyone. Art, music, reading, going back to school, watching TV shows, playing sports, cooking, being with friends, traveling, volunteering, farming, doing literally nothing, or even working, just on something else. It's within our reach. Our obsession with the ideology of work and the coercive model of decision-making holding our society captive are the only barriers to its achievement. We can build a world where work is rewarding, meaningful, and fair. I'm gonna be honest. YouTube has really been screwing me lately. My AdSense revenue is down to a third of what it was a couple months ago, and subscribers aren't being notified of my uploads. If you'd like to help support content like this, remember to click the bell and select all to make sure you get a notification for each new upload. And if you'd really like to help keep the lights on and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. I do a live Q&A for patrons once a month, and it's always a lot of fun. So if you'd like to join our growing community and help keep my channel afloat, Visit patreon.com slash second thought to become a patron.
Thank you all so much for your support. I really couldn't do it without you. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous episodes by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.